Hello, and welcome to the 330 Forecast, where we discuss business agility, innovation, and the future of business. I'm your host, Stephen Boyles, and my guest today is Jamie Smith. Jamie's the CIO at University of Phoenix and a dear friend of mine that I've worked with multiple times over the years. He's a leader in the digital transformation space who's focused on creating organizational culture that encourages agility and adaptability, has helped him drive change at organizations like ServiceMaster, American Home Shield, and Nissan Motors. He's here to talk with us today about the need for businesses to adapt and embrace agility in today's environment and what he thinks the future holds for business agility. How are you doing today, Jamie? Uh, great. I guess I'm, I'm adapting to the new normal of uh, working from home. So <laughs> yeah, it's, been, yeah. it's been an interesting transition for me, but I'm doing great. Okay, good, good. Um, so can you talk a little bit first about your background and how you started really getting interested in continuous improvement and uh, innovation? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I, I kind of usually start by introducing myself as a reformed consultant. Um, okay. So I started out my early career um, in kind of technology consulting. So big CRM implementations, e-commerce, when that was still called a thing, right back in the day. When, and I did that for PricewaterhouseCoopers and IBM. And, and so I got to see um, in that time kind of the perils of the three-year Big Bang project and, and other things. And then, uh, you know, I transitioned to Nissan um, after that. And, and, you know, Nissan very much has a lot of the Kaizen um, mindset and, and the kind of lean production in its car business, right? So seeing how the applicability of that to the technology space um, and how interesting kind of those were conceptually. And that was about the same time kind of the whole concept of agility and agile as a practice and a set of practices were emerging um, and, you know, kind of transitioning to service master, uh, got the ability to start small um, with kind of a, a, an agile transformation and, and then scale that up to kind of basically all of the technology supporting products uh, across all of the businesses uh, for service master um, and seeing how different, you know, it was things were operating at scale, but, uh, but also seeing the true benefits of, you know, just a lot of simple things like, you know, getting getting the, the kind of decisions to closer to where the work is or the Gemba, you know, if you take that, um, as well as kind of autonomous teams and the power that you can do, how fast you can really go um, versus some of the bureaucracy and, and kind of getting the opportunity at University of Phoenix um, to take that to a whole new level where essentially, um, I hate to call it digital transformation at University of Phoenix because... 96% of our students, even pre-COVID, uh, that came to us only ever attended online. And so it was really more, we were a digital company already, but, you know, as, as we got bigger, we kind of took on the, some of the trappings and bureaucracy and things of a traditional university. Um, and so it was more, more of a digital reawakening, um, kind of at University of Phoenix and seeing, you know, and, and really for us, um, the definition kind of, of, of business agility or the closest that we've gotten to is to shorten the time from idea or insight to implementation that students feel, right? So to shrink that as much as possible and, and to be able to do those experiments at a very, very high frequency um, uh, with, with some amount of control. So, um, so there's a lot more to unpack in that, but that's the closest we've kind of figured out. But that's really the intent is um, to get these great digital experiences in front of our students as quickly as we can. Okay, that's really cool. Um, so talk a little bit about, so you mentioned, you know, Nissan Motors and uh, I know you've got the background on lean manufacturing and I know, you know there's been this shift from, uh, you know, a lot of things that agile software development started doing, we borrowed from lean and then it was a, a big software development movement uh, in, in terms of agility. And then we started getting really good at creating agile software development teams. And now we figured out, you know, there's this term business agility that we've all been using for the past couple of years where we figured out it's some of the parts of the rest of the business um, that need some work as well. And so I know we've borrowed a lot from lean there too. Can you talk a little bit about, since you've seen, you know, from the lean manufacturing perspective and also at service master at university of Phoenix, looking at the technology side, what are some of the aspects that you think um, people who are looking to create agile organizations can borrow from practices like lean? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a common misconception that, that kind of the agility mindset is really only valuable in, in you know, as in so far as much as it involves technology or software or whatever. Um, I think to your point, that's where Agile and some of the practices have gained credibility, frankly, because it's so much better um, than, than kind of the old ways of operating. Um, but taking that same 
kind of continuous improvement mindset, um, giving people that are in the Gemba day to day the tools that they need. And that's what Lean is great at is the tools, you know, the tools to kind of create them as problem solvers and then a feedback loop into which they can bring those ideas into life um, very, very quickly. Um, the concept of, of very rapid experiments with as light a touch as possible are, are super applicable. To, you know, we have um, a lot of academic counselors that are primarily either on the phone or chat. We have, you know, enrollment advisors. We have financial aid counselors. So we have thousands of people that are on the phone and, and interacting digitally with students every single day. While that isn't like a software project, um, a lot of the same mindsets, things like Pareto analysis and creating a hypothesis and that continual improvement, they work just the same. And, and even some of the ceremonies. So having a simple you know, five minute tear huddle or stand up um, with your team every day to think about what we're focusing on that day to, to improve is, is super worthwhile regardless of whether it's software or not. So even some of the ceremonies with a light touch um, can, can be very effective in a lean mindset. Okay, really cool. Uh, so you talked about, I mean, that was a great example of non-software development teams using some of these techniques. And I know when we talk about business agility, strategic agility uh, mm -hmm. is a big topic as well and how leadership uses some of these techniques. And I, I know you've done some experimentation with that in your career, um, but it's been a while since we've talked about it. Where are you guys at with that at University of Phoenix, if you can talk about that? Yeah, so um, while, we, while we do have kind of a we, tr we try to keep a 12 to 15 month vision of, of where we want to be strategically. Um, so things like but trying to keep that as simple as possible, meaning like, yes, we understand that short burst learning is going to be important to our strategic future and, and whatever, um, not to have a super long list of all the projects we're working on, frankly. Yeah. Um, but what, but what we've implemented uh, is, um, really kind of five times a year to align with our program increment it just so happens to, cause it, it involves things outside of technology as well we get together and have a portfolio steering meeting and that portfolio steering discussion is really, Hey, are the things that we thought were important strategically last time we did this still the most important things, right? Are we funding them at the right level? So it's not like, Hey, you got this budget and just go away 12 months later, you know, spend it all or, or do whatever. So we're continually kind of reevaluating what we're investing in based on the most relevant and nearest term data. So hopefully over, you know, since over the 10 weeks between the time that we have those, We've done enough experiments that we've learned something. Um, certainly in the case of, uh, you know, COVID and, and some of the things going on in our society, the world has changed also, right? So it wasn't just right. that we learned something. Um, the world has changed. And so giving us that flexibility uh, is, is really, really important. Um, so I, I knew it was funny. We, had a, we just had one of those. And uh, coming out of it, you know, a lot of the product managers came in with these roadmaps. And they were calling them roadmaps, which makes me bristle a little bit because I <laughs> want to call them vision documents. And, and so because um, like don't don't put anything, you know, in a quarter in a specific part of the quarter a year out from now. Like you just don't you just don't know. Right. And so um, and I, I knew that we were making kind of progress as an executive team when Peter, who's the president of the university, said, you know, guys, don't fall in love with your roadmaps. These are really vision documents like unprompted by me. And I was like, yes, this is happening. I think the other thing that's been hard for us, but I think we're making a lot of progress on, um, and, it, and it came from another, we have an all university broadcast that we, we host with the executive team um, every couple of weeks, and, and uh, in that, actually, Peter celebrated the fact that we rolled out a new homepage on our website, which is kind of the front door of the university, um, and it failed. It failed right away, right? But we did it in a, su in a super fast way. We found it now, you know, a couple of iterations later, it's performing 40% better than the last one did. But the fact that we could celebrate the way that we got there, because in the past we would have done the whole website based on that thing that we thought was going to work. We would have gone away for nine months, rolled out this whole thing, right? And in a couple of weeks, we put this out there, put it in front of people, um, and it failed, but we learned from it. And so getting, getting um, kind of a, a, an executive team comfortable with that and being able to truly celebrate that and not just give it lip service, um, that, that's a huge amount of progress as well. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing. Uh, I, I love to hear that that's coming from the president and um, unprompted by you, as you said, that's, that's wonderful. Um, yeah. And so you mentioned, you know, you know, the whole COVID-19 pandemic and, um, you know, people being kind of, you know, work from home, both within your organization, but then also I think in the educational space, that's really affecting people. There's a lot of people that are just talking about just taking a year off and things like that. Yeah. Um, and I know in the past, you know, even before any of this happened, you and I had talked a little bit about this idea of stacked credentials and innovating the way higher education is done. 
Um, is there anything that you can share with us about what University of Phoenix is doing along those lines? Uh, sure. So, um, well, one, we just recently launched our first competency-based MBA. So that's designed to kind of get you through. If you come in with a, with a bigger, you know, set of knowledge to get you through and only learn the things that you don't know, right? So it's, it's really recognizing the fact that when you think about the ROI of an education, um, one of, you know, of course, it's easy to focus on the cost of education and we're doing everything we can to drive that down. But um, the cost of time, especially for our students, is a big deal, right? Our average student's 36 years old, working parent. And so, you know, beyond just the financial cost is the cost, the opportunity cost of time they could be spending with their kids, with their, you know, elderly parents, doing something, you know, Netflix, who knows, right? But I think um, factoring in um, all of those things, understanding that that, that time's valuable. So the MBA CDE um, is, has rolled out and we have our first cohort in that. Um, but we're also working on a lot of, you know, kind of non-credit bearing options in the future. So, um, you know, it used to be that the degree was kind of that stamp of, of approval that said, yes, you've learned, you're employable and whatever. Um, it still is really important in today's world, but it's not the only thing that matters, right? And so um, we are working on ways to um, do things like launch an AWS Cloud Practitioner course um, that we're in the process of where you get that certificate. It's not necessarily credit bearing, although we can articulate it as credits later, um, but it is important you know, for you to kind of get your next role. Um, and interestingly in that space, we're actually taking kind of the approach where those things are, those things can feel a little disruptive to the core business. I mean, think about the core business being degrees, um, and so we've, we've kind of given them a little safe space to the side um, to, to not let the, the, the white blood cells of the organization eat it. And that's how we're kind of experimenting our way through that. So we're not, we're not putting it through our normal um, kind of portfolio management process. We're not burdening it with some of, the, you know, all of the corporate policies and, you know, you can right. P-card some lightweight software if you need to, whatever. Like, so we're, we're trying to kind of create that safe space for innovation, um, not necessarily to be an ambidextrous organization or bimodal or whatever the fancy word is. It's just for some of these things that feel like they threaten the core. Um, you need to think differently and, and behave a little differently um, in, in order to actually make that happen. Because we, we've been kind of struggling to get it off the ground for a while. But yeah, a lot, a lot to come in the certificate space, credentials, um, you know, like credentials have to be recognized also. So that's just giving like a University of Phoenix credential for something. If nobody has, you know, places value in that versus like an AWS stamp of approval or scaled agile framework or, you know, the things that you see posted on people's LinkedIn um, matter. And then I think the last part of that is deeply tying that to career outcomes, right? So meaning when you, when you stack these few things together, what are you now qualified for that you weren't qualified for in the past? And that's kind of where it gets real because our, our you know, unlike kind of traditional higher ed universities that, that focus on the 18 to 24 year old who's getting their first job, right? We're helping someone get their next job. And so it's really important to tie that deeply to kind of careers and, and the outcomes they're in. Okay, that's fantastic. Um, so, you know, you kind of talked about this a little bit when you were talking about uh, the, the, the way that you're changing the credential process. Um, but I'm wondering with the experience you have in multiple organizations, you know, what are some of the biggest barriers you see to, you know, transforming to a more adaptable organization, both, you know, in, in some of the stuff that you've talked about, but also at the strategic and the business agility level. And then, you know, if you can share some strategies that you've seen work in those situations. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think one, I mean, the, the first, the, the first challenge you have often with these transformations is it's seen purely as a technology thing, right? So we kind of touched on that a little bit. It's yeah. like, yeah, I know that works for software development, but it's not going to work out in our contact center or in wherever, right? So, so really kind of getting the belief that um, they're, while not universal, not universally applicable, but I mean, it, it does have kind of um, value in other parts of the organization. But I, I also think the, the other one that's probably the biggest sticking point is um, getting an executive team that's kind of lived their whole life and, and gotten to where they are, frankly, very being very successful in their careers by doing something very different than what we're asking them to do. And especially you know, asking the CFO to say, yes, um, I know that we have kind of an annual operating plan, but we have to be agile within these kind of five at least sections at a minimum and, and rethink we're not funding projects, we're funding products. And how does that capacity change over time? Um, you know, that that's a big part of it. Um, and, you know, I think the other Thing, you know, mistake that we didn't make 
never name one of these things, right? So ne never give it some sort of, you know, fancy program name or whatever, because then it just becomes a thing, right? And so, right. And, and, and really, this is just a thing to get to a thing. Um, so, some of the do's, like we, um, so we started out kind of very small, um, like, like you traditionally do, um, isolated the team, uh, really completely shook up the teams to try to make them as cross-functional as possible in that initial experiment where they could fully deliver a feature without reaching outside those teams, right? So they don't need to go outside for UI, UX. They don't need to go outside for anything. Um, and so that, that started to build those momentums and wins. Um, and then, kind of, then you start thinking about scaling that agility, right? So you have a couple of agile teams, which is great. How do you have a team of agile teams that works together? Um, and, you know, love it or hate it, I think in, in both occasions, I found scaled agile framework um, to be, I'll call it the gateway drug to agility uh, <laughs> because it's, it's, you know, it's, it has enough, it's prescriptive enough that um, you can implement it and train to it. There's enough training out there. It doesn't feel fluffy bunny like, ah, just do whatever you want, you know? And, and so that's, that's a good gateway drug. Um, we're kind of in this point where, um, we're transitioning kind of into a post safe world. And, and really that's really kind of going from feature teams to product teams, uh, which we can talk a lot about, but, um, and, and that's kind of amping up the level of accountability and autonomy that the teams have to decide what they're working on. And so portfolio management moves from calculus, which it kind of is today. And it feels a little bit like, you know, we're somewhat close to the sausage making, um, hopefully down to algebra or arithmetic for us, where we can say, Hey, these are the three to five big things. We want you to focus on how, how those get articulated in your product roadmap. Um, you know, you guys work through it and, and decide and, and go. And so um, I think that's the true kind of level of, of that agility and then also spreading out to other parts of the organization. So if you think about like curriculum development, it behaves a lot like a software project, right? You don't know what's going to work. You have to test it. You have to think about single piece flow and all the things that you think about in lean um, in that space. So there are places where it's very, kind of, you can extend it very easily um, and get those concepts. And once people kind of get educated on it, I think um, it becomes kind of a grassroots thing, uh, right? And, and especially when, you know, they feel that level of autonomy is, is very motivating. So it's been, that, that, that's kind of been the progression a little bit of that, you know, traditional starting small. Um, and I think you also have to dispel the rumor that you can't do big things in this mode either, yeah. right? So, the, and, and because the things that become cross backlog or other things get, they, they do get significantly more challenging, but they're easy, but guess what? They're significantly more challenging if you're doing them through waterfall or any other approach, right? Sure. Big things are harder to do. And so the teams have gotten pretty good at understanding how to break them down and deliver value in chunks. Um, and, you know, so I think it's just been a huge level of organizational learning that, that we've gone through. Um, we almost have kind of the opposite challenge now of, of when I got here was we couldn't run enough experiments to, to prove things, you know, initially. We're just too slow. It took too long, whatever. Um, now it's kind of like we're running so many experiments. How do we control that? And how do we not have the <laughs> experiments either cancel each other out or this cohort got touched by 75 experiments? So I don't know what happened. And so... Um, <laughs> Now, we're also working on developing kind of a more formalized experimental operating system, um, which not, not to stifle innovation, but just to really understand is the data that we're looking at good because we're making decisions off that data now. We want to make sure that it's, it's at least statistically viable and, and all of that. So it's, that, that part's been an interesting journey as well. Okay, that's very cool. Yeah, I like, I like how you talked about, um, you know, SAFE as a gateway drug. I, I remember, you know, for a long time, I used to tell people that, you know, safe was the thing that I wish nobody needed, but I reluctantly admit that some people do, right? Because we had just gotten to this place where all the early adopters of agile practices were already doing it. Um, yeah. And so you needed to give people something that was familiar enough that they would be threatened and, and they would be willing to take a chance on it. Um, and so I, I think that's, you know, kind of what you're talking about there. And, you know, so I can uh, uh, relate to that experience. But you also talked about how now you guys have kind of moved past that safe world and you're in this post safe world uh, with product teams. So can you talk a little bit about what's driving you to do that and, and how is that working out? How are you doing that? So, um, so we're, we're just kind of at the beginning of that journey right now. So we have a couple of teams that are behaving that way. And I think, you know, to the, one of the great things about safe is you can see, the output and teams can focus on output. Like did, how, what percentage of features did I deliver? What percentage of business value? Um, it's a lot harder to get teams in that, in that feature team mode to care about outcomes, 
right? And really kind of bring their full brain with them every single day to say, what, what should this be working like? What's best for the student? How, you know, and, and so, um, it, you know, first of all, the, one of the hardest things that I think any organization that's not organized as a product organization is going to go through is product management is a discipline, right? It's something that has to be taught. Yeah. Um, it is a, it is a, you know, and, and it's teachable. It's not, you know, it's not some sort of voodoo science, but you have to understand, you know, the, the way to prioritize features and user story mapping and, and really how to design a good hypothesis as well as be, you have to be able to manage up to stakeholders and manage down to the teams, right? It's, it's probably the hardest job in the company um, if we're doing yeah. things right. Um, and so kind of developing that talent base um, is, really, really important, but also, you know, the right tools and ceremonies. We're a big user of things like full story um, where we get live feedback of the, of what the users are experiencing because we can't go somewhere and see them using our platform, right? We have to, we have to infer that through. And so um, getting people to kind of develop those skill sets, that's the hardest pivot. Um, and so we're kind of in, the, in that mindset now um, and, and kind of thinking of the product manager as almost the mini CEO of their product and giving them that level of autonomy, but also accountability. Right. And so right. understanding what levers are you trying to move from the from a business you know, aspect and being able to project that, because that's what basically gets you the investment in the number of teams that are working on that product is you you're generating returns. We know that it's not diminishing. You have a you know, clear vision. Um, you've, you've tested those things with various experiments. So the, the believability index is really high if you think about yeah. it. Um, and so um, that's that's hopefully where we're going to get to. And then I also think. While it still will be important uh, to kind of re-look uh, at our priorities every five weeks, I think the notion of continuous flow starts to then come in. So, you know, kind of one of the downsides of SAFE, and we do 10-week 10, 10 program increments, is um, done wrong, it can be like a 10-week little mini waterfall, right, where you yeah. work on things and you deliver everything, the, you know, the sprint before the up sprint or probably in the up sprint, uh, you know, or whatever, because it took 10 weeks to build that thing. and 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 so. Um, we, we've done better at avoiding that trap where we have a lot more that are kind of continually flowing into both the next increment as well as delivering earlier in the increment because they're smaller. Um, but it's a trap that's pretty easy to fall into. And so, um, you know, treating what was bigger in planning is more of a, a quick alignment exercise and making sure that we're relooking at capacity and are we investing correctly and all of those things I think will be where we evolve to, but it's a little early to tell. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Um, yeah. So you talked about being early in your journey, and I agree with you, you know, one of the big struggles we're seeing now, you know, in addition to the idea of strategic agility is this idea that um, product management is a discipline. You can't just take a subject matter expert or yeah. somebody who's been a BA their entire careers and all of a sudden make them a product manager without any education, right? Um, yeah. So how are you guys approaching that? How are you, what are some, you know, if I'm a, a leader in another organization, I'm looking to make that switch to a product organization. Um, what are some strategies you think I should use for trying to take the talent that I have and build them into really good product managers? Um, so the, we're, we're leveraging some, some outside help and curriculum, but one of the benefits we have as a university is we have some pretty solid curriculum development internally as well, right? So, um, you know, while product management kind of generically is a teachable discipline and there are courses out there to do it, um, we're actually starting with educating the executive team. Um, so a big part of, and, and you know, the, uh, there are HBR articles and other things out there, but a big part of true business agility is having an agile C-suite. Um, and, and having a C-suite that understands product management and why that's important and why it matters. And we're actually having a, a workshop on the 24th uh, with the whole, the whole day um, to kind of go through and set what that looks like. And, uh, you know, part of, you know, it's a, it, we're in an interesting time where um, things are so much better and we're getting more output than we did, but we're still, like, there's still a whole nother. So everybody feels pretty good about that. And they're kind of like, ah, this is okay. Like what's, what problem are we really trying to solve with this? switch to product management, right? Because like, it feels pretty good. Um, and so, you know, we're having to create a little bit of that urgency and, and you know, part of the, the COVID crisis has done that for us too, because innovation is going to kind of ramp up at this point and, and uh, especially in higher ed, which has been a little sleepy. Um, but yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, it's not just, it's not, not taking someone that was a project manager. It's not taking someone that just ran a department, right? You have to find um, a little bit of the right kind of raw material for that um, and then pair them with kind of the, the deep level of training, functional knowledge, all the things that they can develop as well as like, 
She said, Miss Aaron, like, yes, yes, we're going to do game film every two weeks in Full Story where we get together and look at the experiences and feel like if we went, like, there are specific University of Phoenix techniques and ceremonies we need to teach them as well. I think eventually that's going to evolve into kind of a continuous um, superhero boot camp type thing that we're going to do where, you know, it's, it's going to be part of it. We'll hire for will and kind of train to skill a little bit too. But yeah, no, like I said, it's the hardest job I think in, and, you know, you have to be able to understand data analysis and all, like deep user empathy, like all these things that, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. And so we will have kind of junior PMs as well that stack to kind of some of the more senior product management. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. You, and, we, and we've talked to a lot of companies and I know we talked to USAA and they have kind of the two in the box where there's a mm -hmm. functional leader and a product leader that are both at the same level and peers and you have that good healthy tension between them. And, and so we're, you know, we're going to experiment our way through it. We'll have a little bit of that. We're going to have kind of more product management. We're intentionally not centralizing it um, initially. So we want it to be still in the functions to feel, you know, kind of that speed of trust gap, right? It's got to feel like one of us that's right. leading this thing. Um, but not have not have day to day a lot of people management either. They need to be able to focus on the experience um, and have that not be a side hustle for them, right? It's got to be a full time thing. Right, right. Okay, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, it's got to be something people are dedicated to, and I like the idea of um, you know making sure that it's it's coming from that department, right? They're owning the change within, um, and then just yeah. giving them the support they need to get there. So that's that's a really effective strategy. Um, so I know you know both in that space and, you know, and, and lots of other places that we've talked about, you're always kind of at the forefront of what's happening. And so, you know, I'm wondering if you can tell some people, you know, tell some of our listeners, um, where are some places that you get inspiration and what are you reading right now? Things like that. And I know you're famous for your reading list that you like to hand out. Um, so <laughs> share with us what's on there right now. Uh, so I actually, uh, just got back from a few days away in California. And so I got to burn through, you know, nothing like a six hour drive through the desert to be able to burn <laughs> through a few audible books. Um, now, so, um, what, what, probably the most interesting and exciting two, two books that not, not necessarily read, but I've used are, uh, there's a book called the invincible company. Um, and it's, it follows on to testing business ideas. So those two books are the outgrowth of what was business model canvas value proposition design. These are the next two in the series. Um, but Invincible Company is really about kind of creating that, that learning loop and, and having that be, having, having the innovation in that loop actually be what powers your company. Not any specific idea, not any specific innovation, but developing that as a core competence, um, which for me is really exciting because a lot of traditional universities um, don't have 41 agile teams that are all working together and can swarm around really important strategic things, right? So we have some right. some things that we've built that will enable that. I um, mean, it, it's getting close to that experimental operating system. Um, I'm, I'm reading Inspired right now. I just started it, which is Marty Kagan's um, product management book. So trying to go on this product journey with the product managers. Um, and I just got done with Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. So um, really appropriate to this time culturally for us in terms of, um, you know, those, those quick and unconscious biases somehow and how to, how to work through those of, that we all have. So some, just some, some really cool things. I think um, I, I'm, I'm toying with this notion of trying to put together like the grand unifying theory of business agility, if you will. Okay. So things like, <laughs> things like implementing beyond budgeting are a big part of that. Right. So yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I promised the CFO I'd buy him a steak dinner if, uh, when he finishes it. So, but, he, but he's been, uh, he, I can tell just based on some of his comments, he's, he's making his way through that. Um, okay. And then thinking about kind of open spaces and open spaces technology and some of that, and then combining that with lean. Um, so things like the goal, if you haven't read that book, you should read that book that gets you in the lean mindset, although it's a little dated, but it's still fantastic. Um, and then, of course, with all of the other kind of agility practices and, and product management practices, which are techniques. Um, but thinking about those whole, like that whole thing as a journey is really important because that's where we start to get into the enterprise and expand just beyond technology. Okay, I like that. Yeah, there's a lot of, um, a lot of the idea of, of looking at things as systems and, and all of that, right, rather than looking at specific techniques. Do you have anything else you want to share with us or um, any advice you want to give to leaders out there that are kind of embarking on the same journey that you've been on? Um, you know, I guess my, my big thing is don't over plan it. 
right? So uh, just start. Like that, that's the whole thing with this is um, start, expect that you're going to learn some kind of hard lessons early. Um, and then the other thing I would say is anywhere where we've tried to take a half measure versus a full measure of something, meaning um, in our second Agile release train, we intentionally chose not to go as deep with recomposing the teams. So in that, we still had some technology specific teams like Salesforce and whatever. Um, it is, you know, we're, we're going to go through and redo that versus the first art where we, you know, we had, we had basically that SEAL team that could go out and complete the mission without ever calling back to, uh, back to base. And so um, anywhere where we've maybe not gone all in, uh, it, it's been challenging for us. And, it, you know, I say all in, it's all in on safe to fail experiments. Like at worst, you're going to lose 10 weeks of capacity and, and whatever, right? But at the end of the day, um, you can you can course correct at any point. So, um, you know, I, I would say that. I think the other piece that, that we found really effective is, uh, of course, having the leadership team bought in is really, really important. But I think more importantly is having kind of the grassroots buy-in, and then it kind of meets in the middle, right? And so, yeah. so sometimes that the, uh, I think it was the term was middle management permafrost. It, it's, you know, it's, it's hard for especially that group that have been historically managers to rethink what their role in the world is as servant leaders. Um, yeah. And so we it's dramatically changed our organization. We've flattened our org. Um, we don't have managers anymore. We have what we call agile people leaders that have really wide spans of control, um, but they're not engaged in deciding what people work on day to day. Their sole role is to coach uh, and work with the teams to get feedback and performance manage the individual as well as then, you know, the, the agile coaches are performance managing or helping the teams perform better, not performance managing them. So, you know, I think it's not just one tactic. Um, and then the last word of caution is, um, you know, I, the cargo cult agile. So it's, it's easy to fall in love with um, all of our ceremonies and all of the new terminology and all the cool stuff. Right. But um, that's not what brings the rain. Right. The, the techniques are yeah. a part of it, but it's, it's actually focusing on the outcomes versus that. It's, it's too easy to get kind of caught up in all the trappings sometimes um, from that side. So just if you can, avoid, that's the one anti-pattern I always say to avoid. Yeah. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm glad to hear, um, you know, somebody like you say that I think one of the, one of the problems that we run into is, uh, you know, people that are trying to facilitate, help organizations facilitate these uh, transformations is this idea of like this checkbox agile transformation where it's yeah. like, well, I hire these roles and I start doing these practices and then we're done. Um, when it's really more about mindset and culture, right? It is. Yeah. And, and or, or you also get like, well, no, we've been doing agile for a while. Yeah. Okay. You're doing mm -hmm. agile, but are you agile? Right. And so, right. and so I, I think there's, um, a difference between scaling agility and kind of enterprise agility. Those are two very different things. Um, one might be a gateway to the other, right? Getting a team of teams to, to work together and, and still, you know, kind of deliver and, and maintain that. But I think the other pieces and where the real transformation is going to come is that next part. And there aren't, it's kind of, we're on that, we're in that place in the maps where it's like, here be dragons. Like there, there just aren't, you know, there aren't a lot of examples of, of large organizations that have done this successfully, right. um, at, at least to where you can pattern after it, right? So the only way through it is just to experiment through it. Um, the other thing, just to brag, brag on my team just a little bit. So um, it's really good timing that we're having this conversation because last week um, we actually moved our last workload out of our data center. So we're closing down a 27,000 square foot data center, um, all right. delivered through with, uh, with Scaled Agile and, and our Agile team of teams. Um, and, you know, in that we've dramatically reduced our cost base, but also freed up a significant amount of capacity to work on new things, right? And so we have over 70 people that are starting a coding boot camp um, that have been engineers their whole life, but thinking about maybe more traditional infrastructure or whatever, um, okay. and we're taking them through five week boot camp. So think about, you know, if you could add at no cost 70 engineers to your team to deliver these digital experiences, um, you know, that's what we've been able to do kind of throughout this process. And so, you know, don't, don't believe them when they say big, complicated, hairy things can't get done in this mode because they yeah. absolutely can. That's awesome. Congratulations. That's a huge accomplishment. I know you guys, have, you know, that, that was one of your, um, you know, big objectives when you uh, started there and you guys have been working on that for a while. So that's amazing. Uh, congratulations. Yeah. Well, and just to set a little context, the, uh, I think the year I got here, our electric bill for the data center was $2 million. So, you know, <laughs> you think about like that, that's just one of the cost savings that we don't have to spend that now we get to spend on students experiences, which is that, that's that's the real outcome and, and kind of minimizing complexity. So, yeah, the team, the team is pretty has done an amazing job on that stuff. Congratulations. That's awesome.
Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I think that's uh, going to wrap it up for us today. So I just want to say thank you for uh, being willing to come on the show and share some of your experience. I know a lot of people are out there looking to do some of the same things that you've already done, and this is going to be great inspiration for them. So thank you. Great. Well, thanks for having me. All right. See you, Jamie. All right. See you.